Hello and welcome to Channels Book Club. I am Olakunle Kasumo. Thank you for joining us once again. Like we've been doing for a few episodes now, let's get started by looking at one of the questions people often ask us, or rather, two of the things people often mix up. The question is, what is the difference between book publishing and book printing? Easy if you know this, but let's help out someone who might need clarification. Book publishing is the process of making books available to the public. Publishing is essentially about turning a manuscript into a book, marketing and then distributing it. Book publishers generally accept all the financial responsibility for the production and promotion of a book. Traditionally, the publisher should pay the writer or author royalties from sales. A typical royalty ranges from 7 to 20 percent, while the publisher retains the rest. Printing, on the other hand, is the physical process of getting text and images out on paper by using master form or template. Basically, the printer produces your book, prints it, and binds it, then gets paid for the work done. It doesn't have to bother about marketing, distributing, or selling the book. Printers are important to publishers in the publishing process. So for those of you who are looking for someone to print your book for you, the right question you should be asking is, where can I find a good book printer? Not where can I find a good book publisher? Only ask for a publisher when you actually need one. So you're going to hand over your manuscript. If you find a publisher, you will hand over your manuscript to the publisher. He does the rest and then pays you royalties for the work done. I hope that helps. Some time ago, we were present to record a conversation between Dr. Oke Ndebe, an accomplished Nigerian novelist, and the iconic Nobel Prize winner, Professor Wally Schwenka. It was a long and interesting conversation they had, but we limited its broadcast due to an upcoming book about the conversation back then. The book eventually came out. Uh, it's titled, The Man Leaves. It was eventually published by um, Bookcraft Limited. It captures OK's dialogue with Wale Shoinka on life, literature, and politics. We did promise to show you the concluding parts of that conversation, and it's time for us to do that. Meanwhile, I had a brief chat with Dr. OK, who is based in the United States of America, about his conversation with Professor Shoinka and the related book. Let's show you the chat, and after then, the second part of this conversation. Dr. O.K. Indebe, did I pronounce that well? <laughs> you did an excellent job, O.K. Indebe. Great. <laughs> Great, nice to have you again on Channel's Book Club. It's such a delight, Kunle. O always a pleasure having you. How is the United States? with the COVID-19 situation now? Well, the, the United States, uh, some parts of it are seeing uh, spikes in COVID cases, uh, but some, some parts of the US, like uh, uh, the Northeast where I reside, I live in the state of Connecticut. Um, so we're seeing, we're coming out of, we're, we've turned the corner, if you like. Uh, so in my state for several days, there have been no uh, deaths from COVID-19. So, so it's moving in, the, in a good direction. Oh, it's good to hear that. Very good to hear that. Please stay very safe. Uh, I tried uh, to. The, the, the last time I saw you was when you had this conversation, that unforgettable conversation with Professor Wale Shoyinka. Um, yes. And it seems like you've come a long way with the professor. Um, what's the story behind that conversation, which eventually um, produced sh what should be your latest book. I've, I've, I've not heard that you released another one after this. The Man mm. Leaves. What's the story yeah. behind that conversation? Well, in a lot of ways, you could say that that's a conversation that I've always wanted to have with Wale Shoinka, um, a writer who has been, um, how should I say it? 
has been a seminal influence in my own development uh, as an artist um, and, and as an ethical being. Um, so I first encountered Wale Shoinka's work in secondary school um, in the form of his poetry. And um, in secondary school, uh, when I first read uh, Telephone Conversation, I was just so enchanted uh, by that poem, by showing his uh, agility and versatility as, uh, as a user of language, but also by what I began to detect uh, to be this extraordinary writer's um, ethical commitments. Uh, subsequently, my father happened to have a copy of Wale Shoinka's uh, prison memoir, The Man Died. And as a secondary school uh, pupil, I read that book. Uh, some of it I understood. Most of it I did not understand because <laughs> Shoinka, as we all know, uh, can be a very demanding writer. Uh, but it's a book whose um, uh, moral uh, consciousness um, I could into it. Um, I knew that it was profoundly important. Um, and especially, um, I was moved by a line in that book, or several lines actually, but I, if you like, the most resonant line for me at the first reading and subsequent readings was where Shoinka says that the man dies in all who keeps silent in the face of tyranny. Uh, and there's another line that I've found quite evocative, where Shoinka says that justice is the first condition of humanity. Now, I was a child during the Biafran War, and um, part of Shoinka's reflection, in fact, part of the reason that he was jailed had to do with his activism uh, to stop the Biafran War, but also to uh, um, nudge Nigeria towards an engagement with the uh, injustice that precipitated war. Um, and so over the years, um, as I became a scholar, uh, I said I became a columnist in several Nigerian newspapers, uh, showing as words continued to inform uh, my practice, um, his uh, entreaty that for the conscious individual, silence cannot be an option in the face of tyranny uh, has been one that has shaped my moral being and, and also my creative being. And so in a lot of ways, um, my first novel, Arrows of Rain, um, has a line um, which I put in the mouth of um, an elderly woman who says to her grandson, who happens to be a journalist, a story that must be told, never forgive silence. So that's my own, if you like, my own formulation of Wolo Shenka's a story that, um, um, uh, that we cannot remain silent uh, in the face of tyranny. So that's, that's, that's my um, sort of... Um, reworking or refashioning of Shoinka's statement. So Shoinka has been a very important uh, writer from a distance. And then years later, as a young journalist, I came to meet him personally. I interviewed him in 1986 for the first time. I've interviewed him several times subsequently um, after he won the Nobel Prize in 1986. And um, so I wanted a kind of summing up uh, interview uh, my engagement with some of the concerns that are literary, um, political, um, and so on, that have defined his life. So that interview that you referenced uh, gave me the opportunity to do all of that. Did, did that period, that conversation with, that time you had that conversation with him, yeah. it was quite a long one, uh, I, I recall well, <laughs> a couple of yes, hours. Yes, yes. Um, yes. Did that experience change anything about the ideas you had of, of um, Wally Shoinka? Was there new revelation or insight or understanding that came to you as a result yes. of that particular experience that was different from what you, you ever had or knew of him before? 
Well, I, I, I wouldn't say that there was um, that I got um, a new information from showing as such. What happened was that I got another uh, perhaps deepened appreciation for the man's depth of humanity and generosity. Um, not only did I do that interview uh, that uh, you were part of at his home in, 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 in Abiyokuta, but then he invited me a few days later to go on the road to, with him uh, to the University of Nigeria and Soka, where he received uh, um, a Lifetime Achievement Award. And then we went to Makade uh, together from Osaka, where he uh, spoke on the uh, Hertzman crisis uh, in the country. And about a week and a half later, he and I were in Italy together at a conference where he was the central figure. I will say that what I got uh, in all of these uh, is a close-up look at Walesha Inca as a moral being um, responding to uh, issues both of literature, of life and politics in his natal country, Nigeria, but also outside of Nigeria. Um, when you come close to showing Inca, you, you, there, are certain, there are certain things that strike you. Uh, one of those is the enduring nature of his commitments, uh, of his political commitment to humanity, you know. Um, so I've always known this, but to travel with Shoinka in different parts of the country and just to see the adulation uh, in which is held by people, whether it was at Nsoka, uh, in fact, when he arrived at the Enugu airport, it was like a carnival. Everybody, the entire airport emptied out and people walked with us uh, <laughs> to the vehicle that took us to Nsoka. Uh, at Nsoka, it was as if a rock star uh, had arrived. And then um, uh, when we arrived in Makodi, and you saw him speaking <clears throat> about uh, this crisis that has uh, really uh, taken root in Nigeria, where hurt men will descend on a community and just um, pillage and destroy, and then take possession. And to see him speak with moral clarity about the abdication of the government's responsibility to the people who are the victims of this hurt men. And then subsequently to go with him to Italy and to see that the mayor of Palermo, Shoinka, has been the man's friend for decades. And at a time when the mob uh, in Sicily was uh, at its most uh, deadly, that Shoinka used to go to Palermo and drive around with this mayor um, on whose back the mob had a target and Shoinka would drive around with him in armored vehicles, you know. And so to watch his interactions with this mayor who is not just an admirer but a personal friend for many years and to see uh, the kind of uh, political capital that Wole Shoinka has but also even more the, the ethical funds uh, that the man um, has, that's really um, one of the things that I got a deeper appreciation for in so doing that interview. You then converted that conversation into this book, The Man yes. Leaves. What, what, what inspired that? The Man Leaves, of course, is, uh, is, is a homage to uh, The Man Died, his prison memoir. Uh, it's my way of saying that Shoinka has lived up to his precepts, uh, that when he says to us that um, the man dies in all who keeps silent in the face of tyranny, that Shoinka exemplifies the scholar, the uh, political being, the intellectual who speaks, and in speaking, he lives. Thank you very much, Dr. Oki. Um, it's been a pleasure Thank speaking with you, uh, as always. Thanks for joining us on Channels Book Club. Thank you very much, uh, Kunle. It's such a delight. It's always been a delight to be with you. Thank you. And stay safe, Dr. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.
I know that you were very outraged when Ken Saruwa was killed. Mm -hmm. And this was another instance where the state, the Nigerian nation state, um, believes that uh, to kill an idea, you kill a few people. Uh, instead of which it radicalized the Niger Delta. And I know that ultimately you became part of the conversation about how to, how to restore a sense of a little bit of calm in that, in that region. Uh, what does it take, in your view, for, for a country to, to, to address what you might call the open sore Mm -hmm. uh, that generates Biafra, generates Boko Haram, generates uh, the Niger Delta militancy mm -hmm. and so on. What would it take mm -hmm. for our country to, to see a modicum of peace? Mm -hmm. It's a combination of many factors. First of all, there is the answer of brute force. Yes. The rampaging herdsmen have got to be neutralized. They do not understand dialogue. Mm -hmm. Boko Haram has got to be neutralized, militarily I'm saying, because mm -hmm. it does not recognize dialogue. Mm -hmm. So for me, those are uh, festering, but peripheral, peripheral issues, which do not subject themselves to the rational process, to dialogue, mm -hmm. to even the um, offering of uh, alternative op options and so on. These are totally uh, dedicated obstacles to even harmonious coexistence. And they have committed crimes against humanity of mm -hmm. a horrendous mm -hmm. dimension that cannot simply be uh, taken care of through amnesty program like in the Delta region, mm -hmm. which blew up uh, 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 pipes, mm -hmm. occasionally you know, uh, kidnapped uh, some uh, individuals. We need a genuine, authentic, inclusive conference, national conference. Mm -hmm. Stabs have been made, uh, as you know, even in Pronaco, we mm -hmm. tried to do that, mm -hmm. but we, each, each one has been tinkering, tinkering with the situation. Truth and reconciliation on yes. um, South Africa. This, this part of the process, but it doesn't, it shouldn't stop at the meeting, the conference table, the production, even of a, a tone, you've got to take that further, mm -hmm. systematically relate uh, policy statement, execution of projects, relate all those to the outcome, the details of uh, the propositions in that, so that people feel not just to use that to say word, own mm -hmm. that process, but to be part and parcel, a visible, palpable part of the implementation of the recommendations of such a... In 1986, mm -hmm. you became the first black African to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Mm -hmm. um, what has it meant for you as, as a writer and, and as a citizen of the world, as, as, as an intellectual, that prize? One word. Hell. Good. <laughs> what, describe that hell for me. It has bred demands, hmm. expectations. It has bred even envy hmm. in some areas. One can cope with that. Mm -hmm. But uh, antagonisms mm -hmm. were totally unnecessary, mm -hmm. uncalled for. Mm -hmm. uh, but those, that's part of human life. Any kind of achievement does that. Mm -hmm. But somehow in the back of one's mind, one feels that in the arts, in the art world, creative world, we should be different mm -hmm. from the rest. I think most of us, without <laughs> accepting it, we, we feel it inside. Mm -hmm. So that's been a bit of a disappointment. Now, it, it, uh, it lost me 90% of the rest of my anonymity. Mm. And I'm somebody who enjoys anonymity. anonymity yeah. you know, mm -hmm. Um, then it made me over ambitious, mm -hmm. having more money than I've ever seen in my life. The result is that I'm now permanently broke <laughs> because being over ambitious means you are embarking <laughs> on projects which normally you wouldn't even talk because you know you don't have the means. No. 
<laughs> so when you won the prize, um, Achebe made a statement um, where he said that uh, the, no the Nobel Prize did not make one, the Ashiwaju of African literature. And uh, in a subsequent statement, you said you didn't want to be the Ashiwaju of African literature. You wanted to be the Obuefi. So this was playful banter. But in what spirit did you receive uh, that statement? Did you understand that Chebet to be speaking lightly or did you take it as a critical, as a criticism? The subject was not even literature mm -hmm. when he made that statement. Mm -hmm. And so I was disappointed that he created a nexus between one's, between my normal life, my normal political, mm -hmm. socio-political life, my normal way of articulating an opinion. Mm -hmm. It was almost like, because I won the Nobel Prize, I have no right mm -hmm. to offer, to do what I used to do before all my life. Mm -hmm. So uh, I responded to it, even though I, I wanted to make light of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was a little bit disappointed, mm. you know, and I didn't see the necessity. Nothing, that particular subject, mm -hmm. which was under contention, did relate mm -hmm. to literature. Mm -hmm. So it was like, oh, am I now to carry this burden for the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. That people will think I'm doing what I used to do before, simply because I now have a Nobel Prize. That, that's mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, there are people who feel that there should be an Achebe camp and a Shoinka camp and they should line up, you know, behind uh, one or the other. I remember coming to Ake years ago, you were not in town, but Ngugi and I were there. And I did an event and somebody um, spoke to ask me a question and said, you're an Achebe man. Uh, really? Yes, you know, so, uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, but what do you think of Shoinka? I said, well... I'm as much a Shoinka man as an Achebe man, you know. So I said, you don't know my relationship with, uh, with Shoinka. And I said, I also happen to be an Ngugi man, <laughs> you know. So, but it, there's that sense of yeah. this binarity. Mm. Where and, and, and what's, for me, uh, a lot of it is also what I call uh, ignorance. Yes. Perhaps literature is too, is too much exposed mm -hmm. and everybody feels they have a right to... Uh, to pronounce authoritatively, yes. not only on the product, mm -hmm. but on those, the producers yes. of the product yes. and their positions in society. The way they will pontificate mm -hmm. on literature is something I would never do. Mm -hmm. If I'm talking about architects, mm -hmm. musicians, mm -hmm. even though I consider myself a little bit knowledgeable mm -hmm. about music, mm -hmm. um, uh, what else? Doctors, mm -hmm. you know, except a doctor as mm -hmm. <laughs> is guilty of. Uh, malpractice mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. even lawyers, mm -hmm. unless I've actually been there and seen a lawyer argue a case, mm -hmm. but people just feel that literature is for, mm -hmm. is open territory, yes. and that annoys yes, me a lot, right. <laughs> open territory, and that is, yeah. come on. Anybody can be an expert. <laughs> yeah. So Achebe's last book, mm. There Was a Country, mm. I know that you've been, you, you've been a, a bit ambivalent about that book. Mm. And uh, it created a certain kind of response. In fact, in my view, it's, it was one of the most weird uh, uh, responses that I've seen to a book because there were those who defended the book without reading it mm -hmm. and those who attacked, attacked the book without, without reading it. <laughs> but I do That's know it. that, that mm. you read it. Mm. And, um, and uh, what was the sense that you got from that final work? Well, first of all, it was an honest piece of work in the sense not just a no holds barred, but the uh, analytical comments were based mm -hmm. on personal experience. Mm -hmm. The part of it which uh, I thought was unfortunate was where he, not just as a glancing remark, mm -hmm. but took pains to suggest that other Nigerians were envious of Igbo. Mm. I, w I found that a bit disappointing, mm -hmm. you know. And, and totally unnecessary, mm -hmm. that's all. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, I felt it was a, a frank and honest book, mm -hmm. and one that, uh, that summed up a gamut of 
emotions that were formerly just expressed mm -hmm. in smaller essays, mm -hmm. like yes. um, the, the trouble with the trouble with Nigeria, etc., etc. Et mm -hmm. So I, yeah, it was a totally informative mm -hmm. and, and educational mm -hmm. piece of work, mm -hmm. and, and necessary. I think it's necessary for. Nigerians to know mm -hmm. exactly how they're seen, mm -hmm. even by one of them, yes. in that frank way. Yes. There's a bit more left, and we'll be showing you that concluding part soon. You may want to watch out for it. I hope you have enjoyed your time with us today. As always, we'll be delighted to get your feedback through any of our social media platforms displayed on your screen. I am Olakunle Kasumu. Remember, one great book can change your life. Bye-bye.